This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So welcome to Alumni Weekend. Welcome to uh, the UCSF uh, OSHA, F OSHA Foundation Mini Med Medical School for the Public. Welcome to Mission Bay and Genentech Hall. Um, I'm Bobby Barron. I'm the Associate Dean for Graduate and Continuing Medical Education at UCSF. I'm an alumnus of um, the medical school class of 1978. I'm also a resident uh, alumnus from 78 to 81 in internal medicine. Um, we're very excited. We've been working very closely uh, with the alumni um, office to uh, make this weekend as robust and interesting as we can. And uh, one of the things that we're very, uh, do very excitedly in San Francisco for the uh, community uh, usually the non-health professional community, although we've learned over the years that many health professionals come to our mini medical school courses, is present material for uh, the community that is very similar to what we teach uh, our medical students. Uh, so we have a lot of basic science and foundational science classes. Uh, we teach clinical science equivalent to what the medical students get. And then we also have taken our continuing education uh, courses and updates and also uh, formulated them for uh, the community and so it's really been a terrific collaboration. We started, I started the mini medical school back uh, about eight or ten years ago uh, with a grant for the, from the Bernard Osher Foundation who had a vision of uh, uh, creating a community education uh, and uh, his foundation with his leadership has led to over a hundred uh, Osher Lifelong Learning Institutes, um, which is a different concept uh, to the Mini Medical School, but uh, we're a cousin. Uh, and our Mini Medical School, which is really focused on uh, uh, teaching the latest uh, news and, and health and science, lives in our Osher Center for Integrative Care administratively and my Office of Continuing Medical Education. Uh, and, and, but it's the uh, foundation that really provides the bulk of the support and, and then a lot of uh, volunteer effort from uh, the people uh, who uh, attend uh, the courses as well as uh, the volunteer efforts of people in our various offices. So our plan for today uh, is we're going to do, uh, we've broken this up into four pieces and we're going to talk about what's new in nutrition. Uh, and I, I've put a fancy title on this, but really uh, the issue is how, how do we know what to eat and how do we know what to recommend to our patients. Um, we're going to talk about dietary guidelines. Uh, then we're going to drill down on some of the uh, controversies related to various macronutrients and micronutrients. We'll define all those for you. Uh, drill down further, focusing particularly on dietary fat. And then at the end, we'll talk about uh, obesity, since that is uh, uh, the central uh, interface, if you will, between uh, nutrition uh, in its broad definition and, uh, and uh, in both clinical health and public health. So uh, let's start at the beginning. Um, and uh, it's really a pleasure when I uh, thought that we might want to do something like this. Um, the first and only person I thought of uh, sharing this with was Katie Ferraro, who is assistant uh, professor of uh, nutrition in the School of Nursing, uh, who has uh, really taking, uh, taken on much of the leadership role uh, for many of our health professional students in, in teaching nutrition uh, in, the, in a variety of uh, uh, venues. 
Uh, most notably, in addition to her live teaching, uh, Katie is the uh, founder of uh, probably one of the largest Coursera courses, and she'll tell you more about that, but this is a, a so-called MOOC, uh, which uh, she can uh, describe for you. But um, it, it's one of the courses UCSF has tried to uh, get more into online education and um, uh, the massive online courses. Um, and this nutrition one has been now given three times. It's been one of our most successful ones. Uh, and Katie has really developed uh, uh, an international uh, reputation uh, for her work in this regard. Uh, so today we've asked her to begin at the beginning uh, and talk about dietary guidelines. Uh, she, we've entitled it Dietary Guidelines from Pyramids to Plates. So please join me in welcoming Katie Ferraro. Katie. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. And as Dr. Barron said, my name is Katie Ferraro. I have the distinct pleasure of teaching in the School of Nursing, so I'm curious who here is a graduate of the School of Nursing? Okay, and during your time at UCSF, did you take a dedicated nutrition course that you can remember? Getting some, a couple yeses, noes, and a maybe. So um, we're very fortunate at UCSF, as Dr. Barron said, that um, the curriculum for primary care and even for our pharmacists, uh, physical therapists, we have graduate students even studying tracks of nutrition, that it does emphasize nutrition. Uh, we live in an era where more than two thirds of the country is overweight or obese, and yet more than 90% of our physicians have never taken a dedicated nutrition class. So if you think about that, it's really kind of startling because where do people go for health information in this country? They go to their primary care practitioners, and yet so many of them are graduating with uh, very big gaps in not only nutrition knowledge, but some of the other concepts that Dr. Barron mentioned, how to effective count, effectively counsel and do motivational interviewing and to help people promote behavior change. So I teach a two-unit online nutrition course for the School of Nursing. Um, nutrition is one of those topics in medicine that translates very well in the online arena. It's the primary reason why I became a dietitian is because you do not have to touch anybody. You can just talk to them. Um, and so uh, we do a lot of really neat online opportunities for our students. Uh, many of our nursing students are working full time. They work very strange hours. Uh, so the online environment works very well for them. Um, it also allows us and affords us the ability to do a lot of really innovative uh, technological programs with regards to counseling. Um, so many of the classroom-based settings were sometimes limited by things such as HIPAA, not being able to actually experience counseling. So we've developed a lot of really cool interactive video tools for our students as well. We also get students from the schools of pharmacy, the medicine school, um, even dentistry students are increasingly interested in nutrition. Uh, so for today's uh, introductory lecture, I just want to talk a little bit about how did we get to where we are today with regards to um, dietary guidelines? Who is it that tells us how we eat? We're here today to learn about the UCSF Guide to Good Nutrition, but where do some of these guidelines come from? So we'll take a little bit of a historical tour through dietary guidelines. We'll talk about some of the current evidence that supports our existing dietary guidelines. And then we'll talk also about the Mediterranean diet, which is getting um, a lot of press as a positive way for the majority of people to eat if, if they can or if they enjoy that. Um, just this week, there was a study out, perhaps you saw it from the journal Lancet, that showed that there 30% of the global population is now obese. So the rest of the world is catching up to us as well. This is not just an issue that faces us here in the US, but certainly globally. Um, and as you can see at the bottom, uh, the UCSF slogan is advancing health worldwide. So many of the concepts that we'll talk about today may be applicable specifically to US dietary guidelines, but some of the research we'll look at will have more of an international bent. Um, as Dr. Barron mentioned, I also teach a massive open online course on nutrition. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later at the end of the course. Um, this is a free online class. Uh, for a small additional fee, there is a component, though, where we offer 21 continuing medical education units for healthcare practitioners. Uh, the course has been offered three times online in the last year and a half. We've actually had over 150,000 students from over 100 countries sign up. So it's a really cool international experience to see what other practitioners are learning about or how they're practicing nutrition in their respective fields as well. So to go ahead and get started, um, the, the reason perhaps why you're all here is because you are interested in health and wellness and have the understanding that with the proper diet and a positive lifestyle, one can achieve wellness. Whereas on the flip side, a poor diet 
with negative lifestyle factors leads to increased risk of death and disease. In addition to teaching nutrition, I also work as a practitioner. I work um, <coughs> primarily with Hispanic populations, uh, geriatric Hispanic populations, and I'm ne it never ceases to amaze me how many communities and certain groups within communities don't link their diet with their health. Um, especially in the Hispanic communities I work in, I oftentimes hear things like, well, type 2 diabetes just runs in my family. I think type 2 diabetes does not run in your family. Um, type 2 diabetes, more than 90% of people with diabetes have type 2, and more than 90% of those people are overweight or obese. And so when we're talking about diabetes management, more often than not, we're talking about obesity and lifestyle and diet management. But you hear people, oftentimes they're very far removed from that. So as healthcare practitioners, we understand the relationship between diet and lifestyle and health outcomes. But even with all of the interest in and all the money surrounding the fad diet industry, weight loss, et cetera, there's still many facets of our population that don't get that the way that they're eating today not only affects their health down the road, but it's actually affecting their health today. And we see that particularly with the rise of childhood obesity. We used to call type 2 diabetes adult onset diabetes. We don't call it that anymore. It's a misnomer because so many children are getting type 2 diabetes. Did you know that 65% of the world's population live in countries where overweight and obesity kill more people than underweight? Um, as a professor of nutrition, we certainly teach our students about the perils of underweight, of malnutrition. Um, I myself was a Peace Corps volunteer after my undergraduate studies. I lived in Nepal for two and a half years, and I worked with very malnourished children, uh, working in nutrition rehabilitation home settings, and definitely saw firsthand some of the devastating effects of malnutrition. I came back to the United States. Um, I went to Cal for graduate school. And when I did my master's in public health, I was blown away by the, the constant reminder of how our public health problem here is the opposite. It's one of overnutrition with regards to calories. But so many of our, of our population, in particular our children, are undernourished with regards to their micronutrient intake. You think about the kid who comes home from sixth grade. He sat down all day in school. There's no physical education in school anymore. There's certainly no nutrition education in school. Sitting in front of video games with a bag of flaming Hot Cheetos and regular Dr. Pepper, that kid gets bigger and bigger, but he's certainly deficient in calcium, in fiber, in vitamin A, in all these other important micronutrients. So we are living in an era where we sometimes forget that our heavy people are actually undernourished. They have malnutrition, or it's just a state of poor nutrition. And in 2009 was really the first year where um, Barry Popkin, a, a very well-known epidemiologist and statistician from the University of North Carolina, did the analysis that there are more people who are overweight in the world than who are underweight. And I think the obesity study this week that came out in Lancet really kind of reminded people, as other countries adopt our lifestyle and our ways of eating, they too are increasingly adopting all of our chronic disease-related problems. So the cost of poor nutrition, chronic disease risk, reduced quality of life, and then, of course, the significant financial impact. We'll not get into the financial side of it today, but we'll focus more on, well, what's being done to counteract these problems? A little bit of history. Um, in the United States, the first recommendation on how we should eat was published in 1894. It was a farmer's bulletin published by the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, there still, to this day, is very much controversy surrounding the reality that it's our Department of Agriculture who sets forth our nutrition policy. Um, we won't get too much into the politics of it, but if you think about that, um, many would uh, agree that there's an inherent conflict of interest there. You have the government agency responsible for telling farmers what to grow, how much to grow, subsidizing certain crops, out of the other side of their mouth, they're telling Americans what to eat, what to eat more of, what to eat less of. And so as uh, Mary Nestle's really championed in, in her book, Food Politics, and all of her work throughout the years, um, there, there is confusion on the part of the consumer because a lot of times our government guidelines um, are very heavily politically influenced. Um, when you hear things like eat less saturated fat, you don't realize all of the, the political statements that really are behind that. And we'll get into that a little bit today. Um, but oftentimes, it serves to confuse consumers more than it does to really help them. Um, a, another publication from the USDA in 1917, How to Select Foods. We're moving into an era where uh, nutrition guidance was based on the knowledge that most Americans were deficient in a number of different micronutrients. 
very much the opposite of some of the problems we see today. Um, in 1930s, the policy was driven primarily by the Great Depression and problems with scarcity and cost. In World War II, the focus became on things like planting a victory garden and promoting the health of our troops, as well as health for the, the future soldiers at home. Um, eventually, we evolved into what is known, what was known as the RDAs, the Recommended Dietary Allowances. And without getting too heavy into the acronyms, that evolved um, in the 1990s into something called the DRIs, the Dietary Reference Intakes. If you do work as a practitioner, there's an interesting tool online called the Interactive DRI Tool for Healthcare Professionals. Um, I'll just show it to you real quick. But rather than downloading a whole bunch of tables and kind of looking through your old nutrition textbooks, this is a really cool tool that's available online where you can plug in your patient or your client's information, their age, their height, their weight, their activity level. And um, there's some, we tend to, as human beings, underestimate our food intake and overestimate our activity level. So there's a little guide here on what exactly constitutes low active, active, and very active, um, just to clarify there. Because you don't want to overestimate your activity because in turn it will overestimate the amount of nutrients that you need. So you plug in your information and it can calculate not only your daily calorie needs, <laughs> but also how, much, how many micrograms of vitamin B12 and milligrams of calcium you need, and so on and so forth. So that's the interactive DRI for healthcare professionals. Um, um, a really wonderful tool provided by the USDA and the Institutes of Health, or Institute of Medicine. So every five years, our uh, healthcare professionals from both the United States and Canada sit down to put together a document. In the case of 2010, it was over 600 pages. I have lovingly summarized it into one slide for you. Um, these are the 2010 Dietary Guidelines for Americans. Uh, we're coming up on 2015, where there will be a new set of dietary guidelines, uh, always a very heavily and politically charged set of what seems to be innocuous health sounding information. So the primary takeaway messages from the 2010 guidelines, which are the ones that govern a lot of nutrition policy and programs in, in this current five year cycle, are listed for you here. And interestingly enough, despite the fact that obesity rise, rates have been rising precipitously for the last three decades, 2010 was the first year when the USDA finally got around to making guidelines directed to an obese or overweight population. In the decades preceding that, they had always spoken to the American public as, well, you need nutrition information for all of the help for the things because you're not getting enough nutrition. And this was the first approach, which was, oh, shoot, you've all gotten way, way too many calories, and now we've got a big healthcare problem on our hands. So the first message is about balancing your calories. Enjoy your food, but eat less. You are, it is very rare to see the government tell you to eat less. We all know that excessive calorie intake leads to weight gain, and yet you can pour through the historical documents and find very, very little, few instances of the government telling you to eat less. Okay? So this was kind of a big move in the sense that they acknowledge overeating and portion sizes, one of the key problems for Americans. Avoiding oversized portions is the second recommendation. We know that of every food dollar the typical American spends, 50 cents of that dollar is spent on food purchased or prepared, uh, prepared outside of the home. I guess most of us purchase the majority of the foods outside of our home. But we're talking about restaurant foods or ready prepared foods or deli foods. And so if you think about the way restaurants serve us, so oftentimes it's inherently flawed in the sense that you get a huge plate of starch, you get a big amount of meat because meat is very heavily subsidized and quite cheap in this country, and then you get a tiny bit of fruits and vegetables, maybe as a garnish. Okay, And if you think about then the way that you should be eating, which is making the majority of your plates fruits and vegetables with small amounts of starch and moderate amounts of protein, it's very different from the way restaurants serve us. But as a nutrition teacher, I'm, I'm constantly amazed by the fact that most of my students don't know how to cook, which is fine, but they think that the way that a restaurant serves them is the way that they should be eating. And so oftentimes the portion sizes at restaurants where most people are eating their meals really do promote overeating and an excessive calorie intake. There was a focus in the guidelines on foods to increase, uh, making half your plate fruits and vegetables. When the 2010 dietary guidelines came out, um, they were a little late. Uh, in 2011, the accompanying My Plate, which is a visual tool I'll show you in a second, came out. And the, the lay media was blown away by this revolutionary recommendation. Half of your plate should be fruits and vegetables. And as a dietitian, it was finally nice to see kind of the mantra that we have been um, repeating for so long 
which is make half your plate fruits and vegetables, really did get adopted by um, the, the USDA. And so it's a nice visual way. As um, First Lady Michelle Obama said, um, we were transitioning from a period of, uh, we were using pyramids for the USDA recommendations to a plate. And she said, you know, people don't eat off of pyramids, they eat off of plates. And I thought that was very simple, but very true. You can visualize your plate and half of it being fruits and vegetables, and then internally acknowledge, ah, oh, shoot, I probably don't eat like that. So. Um, there's also, as always with our uh, dietary guidelines, going to be a heavy emphasis on dairy, um, switching to fat-free or low-fat milk. Um, we know, however, that the majority of, of certain groups, particularly African-Americans, people of Asian descent, um, they struggle with lactose intolerance. So there is some uh, controversy regarding the cultural sensitivity of those recommendations. If I have 90% of my Asian patients who can't drink milk, and I'm telling them to drink fat-free or low-fat milk, um, I obviously need to be a little bit more creative with how they're going to be getting their calcium intake there. And there was also a focus on foods to reduce with a big focus in the last dietary guidelines on being about sodium. Uh, sodium is kind of the next frontier. Um, we refer to hypertension as the silent killer. You could be walking around with high blood pressure right now and, and really not feel that awful. And if you're like the typical American who eats most of their foods from a restaurant or a box or a bag, we know that that food is gonna be heavily salted. Um, the salt shaker is not the primary problem. I work with a lot of elderly uh, people, as I mentioned, and when you start talking about sodium, they oh, can it, honey, I don't even use a salt shaker on the table, I don't need to hear that. I say, well, the salt shaker is not the primary source of sodium in the American diet. It's packaged, processed, frozen, and fast foods. If, if you're eating food out of a box or a bag, or out of a drive-through or a restaurant, the likelihood is that's gonna have significantly more salt than you probably imagine and certainly more than you need. And then at the end, drink water instead of sugary drinks is a uh, subtle way of telling you to stop drinking so much soda. There was, a, in our last set of dietary guidelines, there was some uh, emphasis on nutrients of public health concern. And there were four primary nutrients that based on the household data we know most Americans are not getting enough of. We all agree that we get plenty of calories, but the quality of those calories is sometimes um, is, uh, lacking. And they're lacking particularly in these four arenas. The first one being potassium. Um, from the, the period of the 2005 to the 2010 guidelines, there was a good amount of data published showing the positive effects of potassium intake on lowering blood pressure. Everyone knows that cutting back on sodium and increasing exercise are two key ways to bring your blood pressure down. But a third component has really been added to these guidelines, and that's increasing your potassium intake. It's not potassium from supplements. It's not potassium from medicines. It's potassium from foods. And nicely, the foods that are highest in potassium tend to be fruits and vegetables, which are also naturally low in sodium and low in calories. So the notion there is the more fruits and vegetables we can get our people with prehypertension and hypertension to eat, they're doing themselves a favor in two regards. They're naturally increasing the amount of potassium in their diet while taking up a larger portion of their plate with low sodium foods. Okay, so again, potassium really starting to understand the role on blood pressure. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the revision and the proposed revision of the Nutrition Facts Panel that came out earlier this year. Won't be implemented probably for a couple of years, but potassium will finally be listed on the labels of the foods that we eat. And that's good and that's bad. Uh, it's good to know how much of a, of a good nutrient like potassium we're getting. But if you think about fruits and vegetables, they don't have labels on them. And so the more foods you're eating with labels, the more foods you're eating from a box or a bag, um, when in reality the best sources of potassium do remain fruits and vegetables. Uh, we're also deficient in dietary fiber. Uh, Dr. Barron will talk a little bit about fiber as well, but a good kind of ballpark number for you guys to walk away with today is most Americans need 30 grams of fiber a day. Okay, so 30 is a good number to aim for. But in reality, most Americans only eat 12 to 15. So roughly we're eating half the amount of fiber that we need. Um, I personally am a huge proponent of dietary fiber. Uh, it gets very exhausting to tell people lists of foods that they should not or could not be eating. And people tune out when they hear what you can't or shouldn't eat. But one thing we can almost all stand to eat more of is dietary fiber. Um, I even have a blog on dietary fiber at fiberisthefuture.com, if you guys want to check it out. Um, a lot of positive messaging there about, well, okay, fine, then what can I eat more of? And we have wonderful data to show that more dietary fiber not only helps with weight control, 
High fiber foods make you feel fuller for longer. If you had a whole wheat bagel with some fruit this morning, you're feeling fuller than someone who might have had a white bagel with jelly on it, because there was no fiber in that second breakfast. So fiber promotes satiety. It helps control blood sugars. I'm also a certified diabetes educator and work a lot with um, geriatric patients who have diabetes. And it's amazing how fiber and having fiber throughout the day can help temper those blood sugar spikes. We also know it helps reduce cholesterol levels and helps prevent against certain types of cancer. There's really no shortage of the wonderful things that fiber can do. Um, the government is also always concerned about calcium and vitamin D intake. Um, we're actually starting to see, um, it's, it's not an epidemic by any means, but a resurgence to some degree of rickets in children. And if you think about that, rickets was largely eliminated at the beginning of the 20th century through the voluntary fortification of our milk supply with vitamin D. There's very little naturally occurring sources of vitamin D. If you eat a lot of fatty fish or drink a lot of cod liver oil, you're probably fine. But for the rest of us, if you don't get a ton of sunlight, because you're inside at fascinating seminars such as this most of the day, um, or if you don't drink a lot of milk, as most adults are prone not to do, you're probably not getting um, enough vitamin D. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where we go with the vitamin D recommendations in the 2015 guidelines. Um, the last DRIs that were revised were calcium and vitamin D, and actually the levels went up. So the amount of calcium and vitamin D that you should be taking in, the, the recommended levels keep going up, but the intake levels stay stagnant. And we know that there's a gap between what people are eating and how much they need. Although there is certainly, if you look at the global body of data, a lot of controversy, because you can look at other countries where calcium and vitamin D intake is very low, and yet they have significantly lower rates of hip fracture. Take Japan, for example. You've got some of, with the Okinawan population, the longest life expectancy in the world, very little calcium and vitamin D dietary intake, but also very limited hip fracture. So if you think about it, there's some of the other factors that play a role besides diet, namely sunlight exposure, um, physical activity, okay? And then um, th those are the two primary ones that, that we think are probably playing a role in protecting against hip fracture. As I mentioned, one of the biggest focuses from the last round of the dietary guidelines was on sodium. And um, if, you, if you look at the typical American, they eat about 3,500 milligrams of, of salt, of sodium a day, excuse me. And so, <laughs> Compare that, and what does that number mean? You know, people tend to, to stop listening when you start talking about thousands of milligrams of anything. But the dietary guidelines said the general population should aim to eat less than 2,300 milligrams a day. Typical American is above 3,500. General recs eat less than 2,300. But then they threw this other zinger out there, which was, oh, and by the way, uh, about half of the US population, you guys need to eat just 1,500 milligrams. Okay, so now we've got a 2,000 milligram gap of what people are actually eating and what they should eat. And the groups that are shown to be at highest risk um, or the, most, the ones who have the most stringent guidelines are those who are already prone to higher rates of hypertension, namely people aged 51 or older, African Americans, and those who already have diagnosed hypertension, diabetes, or kidney disease. Again, if you add up those three groups, 51 and older, African Americans, and established hypertension, diabetes, or kidney disease, that constitutes more than half of the United States population. So we have a nice, long, rich history of our government throwing out guidelines that are um, oftentimes remarkably uh, far removed from how the American public is actually eating, and then not giving a lot of guidance on well, shoot, how do you actually get down to 1,500 milligrams? And so what, as nutrition professionals and healthcare professionals, we, we do when we counsel on sodium is really to focus on preparing more foods at home. Probably the number one thing you can do to cut back on your sodium intake is to make more food at home. Because no matter how heavy-handed you are with a salt shaker at home, it is certainly going to be less sodium than you would find in packaged, processed, frozen, fast, and restaurant foods. Depending upon what uh, era you grew up in, you may or may not recognize the four food groups. Uh, my mom is also a registered dietitian, and when she was studying nutrition in her home ec program um, at Misericordia University in uh, Pennsylvania, she told me that she, they learned about the four food groups. And uh, I remember when we had a tiny bit of nutrition in my uh, elementary school education, we also learned about the four food groups. Um, the USDA for many decades espoused the four food groups as the primary teaching tool for nutrition education, and that you should eat a variety of foods from the milk group, the meat group, the bread group, and the fruits and vegetables group. 
What that eventually evolved into was in 1992, the USDA expanded, or moved away from the four food groups, and started the, the pyramid era. And this is the first food guide pyramid. Um, Marian Nessel actually worked on the committee to help develop this. Um, in her book, Food Politics, she talks a lot about all of the political inputs into what appears to be, at first, a very simple visual icon. And this is a visual icon that graced the packaging of packaged and processed foods in the United States throughout the 1990s and into the early parts of the 2000s. Um, at its core, the, the pyramid says, eat from the base of the pyramid. And you can see breads and grains and cereals and pastas listed there. It says eat six to 11 servings. As you move up the pyramid, you can see the different food groups, fruits and vegetables, dairy and meat. And then at the top, instead of pictures of cakes and cookies and donuts, there's little triangles that represent uh, fats, oils, and sweets, which you're supposed to use sparingly. So this was the visual tool that was um, in place from the USDA on every package you bought in this country from 1992 to 2005. And if you think about that 13-year period, it was one of the periods where we had the most remarkable spikes in overweight and obesity in this country. At the end of the period, as the USDA was uh, pondering perhaps moving away from this, they did a number of surveys and found that if you ask the typical American person, what is that, they would say, it is the food guide pyramid. And then you would ask them, do you use it? And they would say, absolutely not. I have no idea what it means. And so, and so through that period, we saw this was actually a very ineffective tool for a number of reasons. And you can probably see some of the shortcomings if you just look closely. Um, look at the types of breads that are in the base of the pyramid. It looks like that massive plate of spaghetti, which is white pasta and white crackers and white bread and white rice. Are those the same as whole grains? Certainly not. We know that there's a remarkable difference in the way that our body metabolizes and handles refined versus whole grains. Plus, it just says 6 to 11 servings, but uh, fails to mention what a serving is. So is that plate of spaghetti a serving? And I get 11 of those a day? Fantastic. I can eat all the spaghetti I want to. But of course, we know that certainly is not the case. Um, Moving up the pyramid, fruits and vegetables, also no mention of serving sizes. Uh, looking at dairy, no mention of the fact that full fat dairy has uh, significantly less healthful than perhaps non-fat or low fat dairy. The meat, there's no differentiation between lean proteins and the high fat meats. And then this fats, oils, and sweets, they don't even go so far as to show you a picture of what those are, let alone serving sizes. And so it turns out from the period of 1992 to 2005, this was actually how Americans ate. They ate tons of white bread, not enough fruits and vegetables. And by the way, if they ate vegetables, it was mostly potatoes and mostly in the form of uh, uh, french fries. And someone said ketchup, which that was also the era where ketchup was designated a fruit and vegetable in the school lunch program. Um, if you look at dairy, we never get enough. You can never get as much dairy as the government wants you to drink. And then you're eating way too much meat. And of course, the top of the pyramid is falling off. So in 2005, the USDA moved away from the original food guide pyramid and introduced this mypyramid.gov. Um, if you, if this is a huge day in the world of nutrition and mypyramid.gov comes out, everyone gets online, the website crashes. Not a very uh, uh, positive start for what eventually became to be a very short-lived period in the USDA dietary guides. Um, a little bit about mypyramid.gov, you'll notice the advent of the URL. Um, if you think about internet access in 2005 compared to today, um, this was one of the most controversial aspects of my pyramid was that the majority of the information associated with this visual tool was online. And at that time, internet access among people of lower socioeconomic status was almost non-existent. So we saw that the groups who needed nutrition education the most were the ones who were least likely to get it if it required going to your library and logging on to learn about mypyramid.gov. Um, there were a lot of other shortcomings to this pyramid as well. Um, in the effort to be simple, they removed a lot of important information and kind of left people curious. Um, the bands represent the different food groups, so you should have a variety of foods, which we all agree is a good idea. At the base of the pyramid, the thicker part was supposed to represent the healthier food choices. So you were inherently somehow supposed to know that the base of the orange group meant eat more whole grains as you move to the top eat less white spaghetti and white rice. Um, people took offense with the designation for the color red with fruits. Red is a universal color for stop. OK, 
Okay. The last thing we need in nutrition education is people saying, I don't eat fruit because fruit makes me fat. I don't know who it is out there whispering, particularly into the ear of people with diabetes, you can't have bananas, there's too much sugar in them. It's true that there's more sugar in a banana than there is in other types of fruit, but it's naturally occurring sugar. It's accompanied by three to four grams of fiber, lots of other important nutrients, as well as a lot of water. There's certainly nothing wrong with fruit. And having worked with um, a good deal of overweight people for many years now, I oftentimes like to tell them, um, fruit never made anybody fat. Okay, you're not 300 pounds because you ate too many bananas. Let's talk about the real problems here. And so we want to encourage people to eat more fruits and vegetables. Um, the oils, uh, you can hardly even see it, but it's a yellow line there. Uh, I even heard some controversies about um, blue being the color for milk. There are some practitioners who took offense with that because we're constantly encouraging people to drink non-fat and low-fat milk. Well, if you've ever met someone who really doesn't like non-fat milk, they complain that it's blue water. Someone said, oh, you're stereotyping non-fat milk by coloring it blue, so. Um, anyway, this, this was not around for very long. One thing that was a new addition, though, was this um, non-male, non-female figure walking up the stairs indicating physical activity, and many people did like that aspect of it, that if we're gonna talk about health and diet, that we do inherently need to have some sort of activity messaging. Um, so that was a new inclusion. But uh, the My Pyramid was very short-lived, and in 2011, the USDA re DA released what we now have, which is the My Plate, choosemyplate.gov. Um, this has perhaps not become as ubiquitous on the packaging of foods as that original food guide pyramid was, but the general consensus is, is that this is a much better educational tool than any of the previous pyramids were. Um, the primary message there is that half of your plate should be fruits and vegetables. Um, in reality, that's very different from the way most Americans eat. So right there, that's a very good visual for people, is what does my plate look like now? And is it even close to being half fruits and vegetables? You might notice that there's um, a focus on grains and protein being the other half of the plate, with grains constituting a little bit more than a quarter. Protein portions should be a little bit smaller. Um, again, as with all government recommendations in the United States, there will be inclusion of dairy, although we know that certainly for some groups that's not appropriate and they would need other um, non-dairy sources of calcium if they are indeed lactose intolerant. Um, if you go online to choosemyplate.gov, um, now with, with more ubiquitous internet access, it's certainly more appropriate to have a lot of web-based tools, and choosemyplate.gov really does have some, some very robust tools that you might be surprised at how good they are, um, especially considering the fact that they're free. Um, the foods have been still color-coded with regards to food groups. You can go online um, and you can plug in your own personal information. I'm just curious, by a show of hands, how many of you guys track your own food or exercise intake, either using a mobile app or a computer app? Okay, a couple of people. What app do you use? It's fitness.com. Fitness.com, okay. So a lot of people use things like MyFitnessPal, uh, Food Tracker, Spark People. Um, there's a number of really good free online apps for food tracking, many of which have barcode scanners now. So you don't even have to plug the info in, you can just scan the barcode. Again, if you're eating a lot of foods with barcodes, you're eating a lot of packaged and processed foods. Um, but, but the government's really kept up with regards to offering good free online tools. And one of the best ones is a product called Super Tracker. So I'll just pull that up for you. If you go to choosemyplate.gov and type in Super Tracker, um, within the last year, the USDA has really revamped their entire food and activity tracking program. Again, this is a free program. Um, you can pay hundreds of dollars for a, a publisher's program or a program that's really not even as robust as this. Um, you put in your height, your weight, your gender, your activity level, and it can generate a plan for you to show you how many servings of whole grains, for example, you should eat, how much fruit, how many vegetables. Um, there's a separate part for children. Um, many parents are confused by you know, how much fruit should my kid be having and should that be real fruit or fruit juice. Um, there's a separate part for expectant moms, depending upon what trimester you're in, uh, how many of the different food groups, et cetera, you should be eating. Um, it also gives you the ability to track reports um, so it's very helpful. I have a lot of patients who use this program, um, bring in their reports, and we compare it, for example, to their cholesterol values or their hemoglobin A1C to see how they're doing with their diabetes tracking. Um, we know that the more you track your own food and exercise, 
uh, the better your outcomes are with regards to losing weight and maintaining a healthy weight. Okay. Um, inherently, we tend to overestimate our energy expenditure and underestimate our intake. So it's very telling to actually write down um, what you eat as you go throughout the day. And so if you're interested in just starting a little bit of personal tracking, I would encourage you to do a three-day self-diet analysis. And a good way to do that is to track your own food and uh, activity on two weekdays and one weekend day. And the reason why is because most of us tend to eat and drink a little bit more liberally on the weekend than the weekdays. So do two weekdays and one weekend day, plug your info in, and then take a look at some of the reports and see, gosh, maybe I don't get enough potassium, or maybe I am getting too much saturated fat. And from there, you can click through the site and learn a little bit more about, okay, well, how can I tweak some of those things in my own diet? Again, that's the Super Tracker program. Almost immediately following the release of my plate, Harvard came out with their own version of the healthy eating plate. Um, a lot of uh, groups that I work with, if they don't receive USDA funding, they prefer the healthy eating plate to the USDA plate for a number of reasons. Um, this is spearheaded by Dr. Walter Willett, who is um, both in the School of Public Health and the School of Medicine, uh, and a notoriously um, uh, vocal uh, I would say he disagrees with a lot of what the USDA recommends, um, and a lot based a, a lot on his own very good research that shows um, we probably would benefit for, from some more refined nutrition guidelines in this country. Um, Dr. Willett takes offense to the my plate that just said grains. If you look back, the orange just says grains, and there's no definition between healthy grains, which are whole grains, and refined grains. So in the healthy eating plate from Harvard, there's a focus on whole grains healthy protein. Instead of just saying, you know, all meat is created equal, which it certainly is not, there's a focus on lean protein. Um, with regards to fruits and vegetables, there's some additional language about variety. And then you'll notice that instead of milk being the blue beverage, in this case, you see water. And Dr. Willett very strongly disagrees with the USDA guidelines about dairy intake. Um, he does a lot of a really unique interpretation of international research showing how many other countries do not drink nearly as much milk as us, and yet they have significantly lower rates of osteoporosis and hip fracture. And he kind of talks about some of the other lifestyle factors that are affected there. Um, this plate also includes oils. If you look back at this one, there's just the assumption that Americans, A, don't eat any fat, and B, certainly don't drink any alcohol, because there's neither of those mentioned on our plate. So on his plate, there is an um, inclusion of healthy oils. Um, using things like olive oil and canola oil. And then also there's a mention of staying active down at the bottom. Uh, long before my plate came out, uh, dietitians and other groups have been using plate-based methods of nutrition education for decades. And one that's been around for a very long time is what's called the New American Plate. Um, this is a visual teaching tool produced by the American Institute for Cancer Research. Uh, it's slightly different than my plate, but it has kind of the same gist, which is, in this case, Two-thirds or more of your plate should be made up of whole grains, fruits, and beans. And then a third or less of it should be made up of animal protein. Same emphasis there, though. Cut back on the amount of meat in your diet. Increase the amount of plant foods. And you see that as the constant theme, um, especially if you're concerned about cancer prevention. We know so little about what components of the diet may cause or exacerbate certain types of cancer, yet we can say almost definitively that in order to prevent cancer, a plant-based diet is certainly preferable. So the more plants you can eat with a smaller amount of protein, we know that there's lower rates of, of certain types of cancer. If you're from Canada, um, the food guides there are a little bit different. They have a, a healthy food eating rainbow, um, much more a kind of a positive uh, image there compared to our old pyramids, but um, many of the guidelines for Canada also apply to the United States. Um, and interestingly enough, for things like the dietary guidelines, they oftentimes have Canadian influence as well. Um, the next one is the vegetarian and vegan diet pyramid. Uh, there's a wonderful website called Old Ways. Old Ways is a nonprofit group that um, promotes health and nutrition through what they call heritage. And so if you work with or you're interested in nutrition guidelines for specific populations, for example, vegetarians or vegans, um, the Mediterranean diet pyramid, these are the guys who first put together the pyramid. They have a soul food pyramid. And there's a lot of really good um, non-industry influenced research and evidence-based guidelines, pyramids, visual teaching tools for nutrition on that website. Um, it, we'll talk a little bit more about the veg or the um, 
the food guide pyramids for the Mediterranean diet in a second, um, but on the Old Ways website, you can find some more good guidelines. They put together an African heritage diet pyramid. Um, some other ones that we teach about in nutrition, the Chinese food pagoda. Okay, so if you look at some of uh, the, the, the teaching tools from China, there's uh, different cultural foods, of course, included, but showing the same concepts that a variety of foods are really what matters. And then finally, a pyramid that we can all understand, which just says, eat less of that, so. So as I mentioned, our food label is going to be undergoing a couple of changes here in the near future. Um, these are this is a proposed this is the most popular. There are two different proposed changes to the food label. The one on the right is the one that seems to be gaining the most traction. Um, we're currently in a commenting period, um, which has just recently been, not surprisingly, uh, expanded. So it'll be even longer until we actually perhaps see the implementation of this new uh, food uh, label. But on the left, what you see is the label that as it has looked since basically 1996, this is the first major overhaul of the food label that the FDA is proposing. And a couple things you might notice that are going to be the primary differences. Um, first, the call out on calories. Notice how the 230 calories really jumps out at you in the new one on the right, whereas the one on the left is showing, um, you know, it's kind of hard to see exactly how many calories are in that. Um, of course, the, the first place most people get tripped up is about portion size, uh, two thirds of a cup. Uh, servings per container, you know, people look at a container and they jump right to calories and don't realize they had two or three servings. Um, a couple other things that will be added, vitamin D will finally be added at the bottom underneath the dark bar, um, and potassium is going to go in there as well. The two that drop off, vitamin A and vitamin C, Americans are not deficient in vitamin A or vitamin C, so it's kind of silly to be including that information on the label. The percent daily values will be moving to the left-hand side. And probably the area that I know myself, but I would say most nutrition professionals are most excited about is the inclusion of the added sugars line. You can see that it's indented to the right on the label on the right. Currently, as it stands, when you go to buy a product, let's say like a yogurt, you can't tell how many grams of sugar came from lactose, the naturally occurring sugar in milk, and how many grams of sugar came from the added fake fruit flavoring that they put in your fruited yogurt. So in the future, the added sugars line will help Americans realize, oh my gosh, this is the equivalent of three or four or five teaspoons of sugar. And if you look at your typical fruited yogurt in the grocery store today, there are four teaspoons of added sugar. Now, if you walked into Starbucks and you took your regular non-fat yogurt and opened four packets of sugar and poured it in and stirred it up, people would look at you aghast. But when you buy packaged and products foods right now, those actually, you know, you are getting the equivalent of four teaspoons of sugar. So that added sugars line will really be beneficial. The last thing I want to just finish up with today is the, um, a little bit of an overview of the Mediterranean diet, um, because this is the one that the data is showing us pretty strongly that we have some great outcomes um, if we can eat a Mediterranean lifestyle. Even just this week there was a study, I thought it was funny, um, analyzing uh, which countries' kids are most likely to eat in the Mediterranean lifestyle, and it's not the Mediterranean diet countries. The Mediterranean diet is actually based off of the way people on the island of Crete ate in the 1960s. And of the countries that they studied in this new study this week, the kids from Crete were the least likely to actually eat a Mediterranean diet. Okay, and so um, we know that as other countries, again, adopt Western lifestyles, McDonald's, et cetera, they're trending away from their traditional ways of eating, as we're increasingly trying to eat more like them. Um, the, the Mediterranean diet as a term was coined by Dr. Ansel Keys, uh, uh, one of the forefathers of many important areas in nutrition. He's the uh, K in the infamous K ration. Uh, he did a very important seminal study called The Biology of Human Starvation that really set the stage for how we refeed malnourished and starving um, cancer patients, et cetera, today. But with regards to the Mediterranean diet, he, had, he was um, based out of the University of Minnesota, and he had this fascination with why do middle-aged white men die of heart attacks in America, but not in other countries? And so he put together what eventually was uh, called the Seven Countries Study. It was conducted from 1958 to 1970, looking at men aged 40 to 59 in 18 areas of seven countries. And basically, he was the first to explore the associations among diet and then the risk of heart disease. And of the work that he did, he, he really set forth the evidence for which we now we very clearly understand that a diet that's high in fat and certain types of fat, particularly saturated fat, increases the risk of heart disease. 
So he demonstrated through the seven country study the degree to which the diet, and in particular saturated fatty acids and cholesterol, predict present and future coronary artery disease. So there are many benefits to eating a Mediterranean lifestyle, but the one which we've known for the longest, and the one that's most clearly established, is reduction in heart disease risk. Since heart disease is the number one killer of Americans for both males and females, it makes sense for most of us to be eating in this vein. The principles of the Mediterranean diet is that it's plant-based. Okay, there's a little bit of meat, there's a little bit of dairy, but the focus is on whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. Very minimal processed and packaged foods, activity is included as part of a healthy lifestyle, and then of course there's the emphasis on healthy fats. Actually, if you look at the percent of calories in a Mediterranean diet, it is not a low-fat diet. And what's nice is that as American groups have adopted the Mediterranean diet as a recommended way of eating, we've moved away from this low-fat messaging that was so pervasive in our country in the 1990s. And if you remember the 1990s, you could buy low-fat everything, right? Low-fat snack wells and low-fat entomons and low-fat cookies and this and that, but they were packed with sugar. You take the fat out, add the sugar, there go hundreds of extra calories and everyone got fatter on these low-fat diets. We're really moving away from low-fat messaging here in the United States, which is nice, with the emphasis being on, you should eat fat, but it should be healthy fat, primarily from fats like olive oil and canola oil. So this Mediterranean diet pyramid, this is again that same group, old ways. The Mediterranean diet pyramid, as you can see, the bulk of the foods there are plant foods. The base of the pyramid mentions the importance of activity and family meals. Um, there's a, there's a de-emphasis on animal-based foods. There's an inclusion of wine, okay, wine most days of the week. Um, we know that the alcohol consumption in moderation can help to increase slightly your good cholesterol levels. It's not a reason to take up drinking if you don't already drink, but at least there's mention of um, alcohol playing a role in moderation in a healthful lifestyle, which you'll notice most of the United States recommendations, they just ignore alcohol entirely. The focus is on fat with good fats, olive oil, nuts, seeds, and limited animal foods. Um, not only are eating those good fats, the mono and saturated fats, protective against heart disease, um, but we know that if your lifestyle, especially one that includes physical activity, plus this way of eating, if you can do those in combination, you stand the greatest chance of reducing your risk of heart disease. There is inclusion of alcohol, moderate consumption of wine normally consumed with meals. Um, there's an actual definition for moderation for those of you who are interested, no more than the equivalent of one glass of wine per day for women or one to two glasses of wine per day for men. And then I just want to finish up by showing you three recent studies. I guess one of my uh, bullet points is missing there. Um, but we have really good large-scale data to show um, that the Mediterranean diet is effective on a number of levels. Uh, one of the first studies is the PREDIMED study um, done in 2006. Um, the sample size, it says 722. It's actually over 7,000. Missed a digit there. Um, asymptomatic persons age 55 to 80 who are at high risk for heart disease. Um, after three months of follow-up, it basically was shown that those who were randomized to the Mediterranean diet groups had lower inflammation markers. They also had uh, lower levels of bad cholesterol. We know that the, the high levels of bad cholesterol are associated with increased risk of heart disease. In 2011, another large-scale study, a meta-analysis that looked at over half of a million participants, um, was put together to establish how the Mediterranean diet might play a role in what's called metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is a cluster of risk factors that increase risk for other chronic diseases. And the meta-analysis showed that adherence to the Mediterranean diet was very highly protective against metabolic syndrome, showing a 31% lower risk of developing metabolic syndrome if you followed a Mediterranean diet. And so slowly these studies are kind of putting a nail in the coffin of the low-fat messaging that the United States used to really strongly espouse in the 1990s for heart disease. Um, if you've paid attention to the American Heart Association guidelines, they don't talk about low-fat diets anymore. They talk about heart-healthy diets, and heart-healthy diets are those that very closely mirror the Mediterranean diet uh, lifestyle. Lastly, we had a very big study last year published in 2013, um, big with regards to the fact of its impact. Um, this was a study that looked at over 7,000 people who were smokers, overweight, had diabetes or other risk factors, and they were randomized into either a low-fat diet group, which is what we used to tell everyone to eat 
in order to prevent heart disease, or two different Mediterranean diet groups. They just got a variation of the amount of olive oil they were given and nuts. Um, this was the study that showed very meaningful endpoints. And namely, it was that if you eat a Mediterranean diet, you have lower chance of death from heart attack and stroke. And that's important because we, we want to study meaningful endpoints. We want to reduce death from heart attack and death from stroke with diet and lifestyle if we can. It's great to help lower someone's cholesterol levels. There's many people walking around with perfect cholesterol levels who are still at risk for heart attack. So this study showed that 30% of heart attack and stroke death can be prevented by switching to the Mediterranean diet. If you're interested in learning more information, the University of Minnesota website has some great historical data about Dr. Keyes, about his seven country study, and how that kind of evolved into what we call the Mediterranean diet, but certainly was around for many generations uh, long before Dr. Keyes. Um, there's some information from old ways um, about the Mediterranean diet. Uh, the American Heart Association has now adopted the Mediterranean diet as a preferred way of eating in the US. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to give you a link to that massive open online course I was telling you about. Um, this is a six-week free online course, the, the one that we've taught three times so far through UCSF in the past year and a half, um, offering 21 continuing education credits for the following professionals there. And we'll probably be offering it again starting um, a little bit later in 2014. So thank you guys for the opportunity to uh, talk about some of these guidelines, and I'll be back after the break to talk a little bit more about dietary fats.